Okay, let us get started. Good morning, everybody, and thanks so much for being here. It's Saturday morning at 9 a.m., not the best time to be <laughs> having an uh, 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 event, but uh, we really appreciate you being here, and we very much appreciate the panelists uh, for being here. So let me welcome all of you, and especially um, uh, those of you who are here uh, rushing over to the negotiations this morning. And... Um, Today's event is about transparency and capacity building initiative for uh, transparency. You probably all know we play a very unique role in terms of advancing enhanced transparency framework for the uh, Paris Agreement. We, do, we are providing support to the countries through what's called the capacity building initiative for transparency. In parallel to that is the, the support that we're, we're just started to provide for the uh, enhanced um, um, Biennial Transparency Reporting Framework. So today is a day to, to take stock of what's going on, hear from the countries, uh, listen to what the, the, the perspective is as well as the, the, the request from the countries might be, and also have some reflections from the private sector, and also have a Triple C Secretary give us a state of play what's going on. So without much ado, um, let, let's take a moment to, we would like to show you a very short video on CBIT. It's less than two minutes and it's gonna be showing your overhead. So Olivia, please. As bold and ambitious as the Paris Agreement is, it will be judged by future generations on what it really accomplished. The COVID-19 pandemic has shown us the intricate balance that exists between humans and nature. Embarking on a low carbon trajectory is essential to avoid the impacts of climate change. The journey to a low carbon and resilient planet begins with you and you and all of us. CBIT is helping ensure we are on track to address climate change. With CBIT support, you'll be able to track progress on the goals your country has established under the Paris Agreement. CBIT support is strengthening countries' national institutions for transparency, developing tools and trainings, and improving transparency over time. CBIT promotes transparency in three key areas, inventories, action, and support. Inventories help determine the country's starting point for tracking progress. Action tracks the progress of a country's mitigation and adaptation efforts. Support tracks technology, training, and financing that has been provided and received. CBIT support builds the capacity of countries in reporting, improving accuracy, ensuring that lessons learned, the successes and failures are shared, not just within our own countries, but with the global community. These reports keep countries informed of their progress and inform the global stock take, a process that will assess the collective progress toward the Paris Agreement's long-term goals. With CBIT, we are able to better track progress we are making to reduce global emissions and cope with the impacts of climate change and build a roadmap for the future. And that's good for the planet and for us. For more information about the CBIT, visit www.thejeff dot org slash cbit as bold and ambitious as the Par great thank you so much for that video um, so let's just get right into the panel discussion and um, I would like to introduce our panelists today very briefly we have Carlos Manuel Rodriguez the CEO and chairperson of the global environment facility we're very fortunate to have Ambassador Black Lane, Director of the Department of the Environment of Antigua and Barbuda, and Ambassador for Climate Change. She's very well known to all of us. Thank you for being here. And we have um, Mr. Wilson Tarpe, Executive Director and Chief Executive Officer of the Environmental Protection Agency of Liberia. And he is also GF's official focal point. So thank you very much for being here today. And Jigme, who is manager of Triple C, and he, I would say he's a, he, you are the key person from the Triple C when it comes to transparency negotiations. So 
what we have here today is a, I would say, the all-star lineup for transparency as well as issues related to the GEF. So very, very happy to have this great panel. Thank you so much. Okay, so let us start with uh, Carlos Manuel, if that's okay with you, yeah? So today my first question to you really isn't necessarily about your role as a CEO yet. Let's just reflect on your experience um, from your time as a Minister of Environment and Energy of Costa Rica. And the, the reason is that Costa Rica was one of the, the, the first movers, I would say, on CBIT as well as transparency. So can you share your country's experience with CBIT and building your transparency framework? And share a little bit about why you think the transparency is important from your perspective? And, um, and more importantly, how do you think transparency can help raise the ambition of countries, generally speaking? Thank you. Over. Well, thank you. Thank you, Cheese, and, and thanks, everybody. Um, super delighted to be here with um, our colleagues in a moment in time when the, we need to think beyond what we agree in Paris with regards to transparency, because it's not just a reporting mechanism to keep global track on what countries are doing. It's more way, it's way more than that. This, this is gonna become a political parameter on the performance on governments into the future. Uh, you can go to any country and try to, for, to see which are the mirrors and which are the sites where the emissions are coming from, and there is no information. You got information at the very broad national level by sectors. And if I associate emissions with what we did in the early days, at least in my country, in Costa Rica, with regards to deforestation and land use change, we knew where deforestation was happening. We knew the sites, we knew the actors, we knew the companies, and it was extremely helpful to have that data and information so we civil society were able to pinpoint them and to engage with them uh, through many different ways. Um, you know, sometimes the engagement was, you know, conversations, sometimes the engagement was through the courts. Today, if I want to do political control from civil society of what the government is doing and what the private actors are doing, it, it's impossible because we don't have data and we don't have information. So I tend to believe that what we created in Paris within the, the enhanced transparency framework is, is turning as technology is evolving into a very interesting mechanism that not only help us to, to report in a very transparent, honest manner, uh, the performance of countries, but within the countries, it will become a major tool for civil society uh, climate action. Uh, and uh, the same way that today politicians has to respond to their commitments on growth, social development, poverty alleviation, they need to respond to civil society and other actors, private sector, on their uh, climate performance. So this is, uh, is what I see. The, um, but going to your question, uh, before Paris, we, we had the national the greenhouse gases inventories done by scientists. And uh, yes, we, we, the country, we had a lot of support to develop that. And the effort was a very nice effort, uh, but, and very scientific driven, but has no political implications. There was no link within the scientific effort of doing the inventory in reporting with the measurement of the climate actions on the different sectors. So there was a huge, huge gap within the data and the decision-making processes. Um, when I was minister, one, one of my top priorities was sitting down with the scientists and the experts that did, from the National Meteorological Institute that did the, the national inventory, because I wanted to see if uh, there was some way for me to keep track uh, and monitor of my political decisions regarding my very concrete objectives in uh, reverting emissions from land use change, reverting emissions from the way we produce our energy, solid waste, agriculture, and, uh, and transportation. And, and it was very difficult. But that was um, in the early 2000s. Um, uh, I left office a, almost a year ago. But a year ago, things had evolved thanks to the support of uh, Jeff, 
the support of the conventions and the, particularly the Paris Agreement, whereby now I was able to really connect a political decision regarding the implementation of my NDC, in this case, the decarbonization plan and the uh, monitoring. And I began using that as a strong political platform. So the different monitoring of uh, greenhouse gases and monitoring of climate actions gave me as a politician in 2019 the possibility to promote the decarbonization plan in a, con in a very positive context because I was able to prove that our emissions from the transportation sector, because we don't have emissions from the electric sector, Costa Rica has gone 100% renewable in the electric sector. So my, my challenge was the transportation sector were totally upset by land use uh, and forest. And I began to process information that otherwise I would never have had the possibility to really strengthen the argument of why we need to decarbonize our economy. Because uh, I was... I was, um, the government was dealing with a 6.5 fiscal deficit. The government was unable to pay the debt. The government was unable to finance ordinary expenses. Uh, we had the opposition in Congress saying no more taxes. You need to cut expenses. And I was there, you know, like a sitting duck, presenting the decarbonization plan. And everybody was firing at me saying, you are crazy why we need to decarbonize our economy if, if Costa Rica's uh, emissions are 0.005% of total global emissions. Why should we go through this harsh economic process of decarbonize when we have a, um, a fiscal deficit? But the information that came out of reporting uh, to the convention gave me the data by which I was able to create a very strong political narrative that decarbonizing my economy was not against our aspiration for healthy finances and economic growth. And that was beautiful and wonderful. Now, uh, based on this experience and reading, because I try to read as much as possible, reading the advances in the new technology, these, um, the, these uh, methodologies to assess and measure will become one of the biggest uh, assets that civil society will have in the future to do political control of the private sector and political control of, um, of the public sector as we do it with water pollution, as we did it with land use change. And I think that uh, this is wonderful and great. Yes, besides the global objectives of the Paris Agreement to align everybody with the same standards and be able to measure all with the same baseline and methodologies, the real, real benefit will happen at the country level. When we are, well, because we will be creating those tools that will help civil society to do political control, will help the political class to really assess progress in an objective and straightforward manner. So the GF will continue supporting countries in, its, in this effort as it continues to evolve and become an excellent decision-making political control tool in every single country. Thank you so much, Chis. Thank you so much for that, Carlos Manuel. It really, you really set the stage to talk about transparency, not just for the, the global international stock take as well as issues of having a transparency of action and support comparable among countries, but really how to use the numbers and data as well as the analytics to help inform policy making as well as uh, advance the climate agenda. I think this is a very good um, example from Costa Rica. Thank you. And now we turn to uh, Ambassador uh, Black Lane. Diane, if I may call you that. <laughs> um, for us, Antigua and Barbuda really has been a front runner in developing capacities related to transparency. And also uh, coming to the GEF to, to access resources for both the CBIT, which is for the capacity element, but you are also being one of the front runners to access resources from the, the, the biennial transparency reporting. And I think this is uh, in small, no small part thanks to your leadership as well as vision and knowing how the, um, the, the requirements are uh, 
just around the corner, so to speak. So with that in mind, um, can you share uh, some of the experiences that you have had in Antigua and so, uh, so far? And how is this working out in terms of the CBIT effort? And um, what's your view right now of the, uh, the state of play vis-a-vis -vis the, um, the readiness of your country vis uh, for the ETF, as well as the transparency reporting? Over to you. So thank you so much for inviting me. I'm sorry I have a cold. I test negative for COVID, so please don't get too worried. I test every day. So, um, right, so Antigua and Barbados is a very tiny country. And um, in fact, when I started coming to these negotiations, many countries like, you're so small, why are you even here? You know, um, because you don't have very little, you have very little emissions. Uh, oh, you should be able to collect data easily and so on. So. Um, but we don't see it that way. So I, we think small is great. And if you start small, then if you can design a system for the small, then it is great for the big. So if the small cannot participate, then it means something else is wrong with the overall system. <coughs> so uh, we don't see ourselves that way. So Antigua and Barbie, they put out an NDC that we will decarbonize our electricity sector by 2030 and our transportation sector by 2035. But as the head of the, uh, the Jeff is saying, there's a huge political risk when you're trying to do this. The fossil fuel industry is really powerful. And if a politician today decide I want to phase out and they declare it publicly, they will start to fund the opposition. So our government had a difficulty um, wanting to do what, it's not only the right thing for the planet, but it was the right thing for the government budget for their income, right? We spend 80 million US dollars per year on importing fossil fuel for Antigua and Barbuda. We can generate all of that at home through wind and solar easily. So we can develop our own national energy system, but we, cannot, we couldn't move because of vested interests. So what the CBIT process did for us, it's more than the, the process than the end game it gave us an opportunity to engage everybody into data collection and to count for themselves. Because just like the COVID pandemic and all the fake information about vaccines and what to use and so on, persons were seeing things online in social media and they felt they really believe a wind turbine will cause cancer. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge amount of misinformation out there. So <clears throat> we see the CBIT process and we see the BTR process as a way to not only get government involved in the data collection process, which is hard. Many politicians, sorry, ex-politicians, don't use data, you know? They have their own political data, and they, you know, polls and stuff like that. And so to get a politician to agree, we're gonna use a million dollars. That's a lot of money for us in Antigua to spend on data collection. That is a tough sell. And at the, the GCF, they have $3 million for NAPS. Oh my gosh, that was even tougher sell. My prime minister was like, we need all of this money to, you know, that could do, I said, yes, but the data is important. And we also say that the, some of the biggest companies in this world, the only asset they have is data. So Google, um, Facebook, you name it, it's just data. They don't own buildings, they don't own, you know, they're not drilling for nothing, and they're the, some of the biggest companies. So it took a while to get everybody on board. Many, and we don't have everyone on board. However, we convinced the Ministry of Finance, which is the, was a big win for us through the CBIT process. And then we're now able to actually model economic data to show that they can, especially when we're doing our NDCs, we had the data. Our NDC review came at the same time as we're implementing our CBIT. So together, they allowed us to provide as accurate as possible data to show our cabinet and to show our people how much money that they can save. So um, Antigua and Barbuda have aspirations to be part of the ETF. We have aspirations to be part of all aspects of the Paris Agreement and to give our people access to all of those. So the best thing that we can give them is a strong foundation on data. And this is how we see it. And uh, even though we're small, we're still going to take a lead. Thanks. Thank you so much. I think um, the fact that it's, it's about data as well as process of getting, um, utilizing really uh, the CBIT or the support we can provide 
um, to build the process as well as get everyone around the table towards decision making and really having the data. Those are um, uh, very uh, insightful Can I comments. Can one thing? Yes, of course. And the Jeff is much easier to access than the GCF. So you can't say that Thank because you. this is with the GCF. <laughs> 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 Thank you. We're we're so like sisters. You see, Jeff and GCF. I know, <laughs> I know. I see them hanging around. So I'm hoping to make them jealous to see them step up their game. But I just wanted to say thank you for small and developing states. That's a big deal for us, right? So thank you so much. Thank you for that. I'll take it as a comment that, that we are we're pretty well streamlined. Thank you, Diane. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Let us now move on to Professor Tarpe um, uh, from Liberia. Liberia has been a very active player when it comes to CBIT. And also, just like Antigua, we were impressed that you were one of the first countries that also uh, came to us to access to get started on the BNM transparency reporting. In other words, your country is taking a very advanced stance as well as taking the process seriously to get ETF ready and also build the capacity to enable your country to, to have the transparency of support and transparency of, of action. So what was the rationale for Liberia to, to get started so early on the CBIT and um, also to access resources to prepare for the BNM transparency reports? And can you say a little bit about how has the GF resources um, help your country to be ready and build the capacity and get the data to, to inform the decision making. Over to you, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Like my colleague from Costa Rica said, in order for a country to meet its commitment under the Paris Accord, it must be able to provide information that is cogent, information that is verifiable, information that is transparently obtained. Then, like my sister from Antigua said, but where is the information? Two sources, private sector and the public sector. The private sector will be the companies, the economic actors. But the government is the public sector. Why do we need them? We need them because whatever we do, we must get a buy-in. If we don't have a buy-in, it doesn't work. So, what we did in Liberia was to initiate the conversation first with the government. Because if I want information on transportation, I have to go to the Ministry of Transportation. If I want information on energy, I have to go to the Ministry of Landmines and Energy. If I want information on waste, I have to go to the Monroe City Corporation. If I, have, if I, I need information on forestry, I have to go to the Forestry Development Authority. And all of these agencies are government agencies or government-related agencies. So what we did when we put out the, the, the proposal to come to you was to be able to get information from these sources. And in the absence of the information, it would have been difficult to make any decision. So what did we do when the CBRT information, I mean, when the resources came in, we link the sector ministries. Each ministry or agency in the country that we have in the sector, we have a hub there. And thanks to this, uh, the CBRT intervention. Why did we do that? Because if, 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 if we need our information, like my, 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 my colleague said, say for instance, fossil fuel, the emission from gas, there was a decision that the government was trying to make concerning the importation of used cars. And people said that, uh, well, the older the car is, the cheaper it will be. But the older the car is, the more it will emit GHG. So the decision was, how do you tell the government you can't bring old cars? The government tell you, well, I bring an old car, the population is mostly poor, so the guy can you know, buy the car very cheap, run it, and read a return. But if you did that, then Liberia's commitment on the Paris Accord would be harmed. So how do you tell them that? It was through the CBIT information gathering in the, in the transparency report, we're able to gather data 
that when you use the car, when the car is old enough and it is imported, it uses fossil fuel and the, 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 the fumes from there we generate things that we do not want to generate. So the information, the research, the data that we got, because of the clarity and the quality of the data, the decision was made that we are no longer bringing a lot of vehicles more than 10 years to come into the country. Now, without the CBRT intervention, it would have been difficult to do that, even extremely difficult to do that. So we look forward to, 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 to more intervention, more resources to, 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 to improve that. Are we there yet? No, but we definitely are on our way. So the GF intervention on the CBRT is important. Now, the biannual transparency report is important, but it is a function of what we do in the CBRT process. If the CRB, CBRT process is any flawed, then that biannual transparency report will be flawed. But another thing we can create in the BTR is a countervailing approach also to make sure we can counter check mm -hmm. what is coming from the CBRT. And this is a process we are committed to, and I can say that the government has been able to buy in. For the first time, I can tell you the issue of environment now has reached the level of the presidency. He was here the other day. It's not an easy thing to have policymakers at that level to subscribe to issues of climate change. So I think uh, the, the country as a whole is, 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 is in there. Again, are we there yet? No, but significant progress has been made. So what do we look forward to? Improve resources so that we can, we can, we can, we can in, 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 uh, uh, harness the, 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 the quality of what we have. We have the infrastructure, we have the, the framework in place, we have more people in there, but be able to, to, to improve on that, on that report and build that capacity better. One thing you don't want to do is to build capacity and then you do not sustain it. That capacity has to be sustained. Once, you do not, once we sustain the capacity, the same, it gets better and better and better. So this is the approach that we have taken and we can say that without the Jeff intervention with this, trust me, we would not be anywhere near here. So um, Liberia has been committed, we are still committed, and, 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 and some of the people that we have, in order for us to be able to do that, we had to go for self-training. Self we exchanged, support went to Ghana, support went to Uganda, other places, to share the information. And guess what? That exchange has been meaningful because know-how has been shared, knowledge has been, has been compared, and we improve on one, we are better on this, we, 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 you, you create that, and there is a, is this a synergy. So uh, there's no question that the, 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 the CBRT intervention has been helpful. Again, we need to improve on that, and more resources we need to do it. One, to make sure we can continue to improve the quality of the reporting, I mean, and, 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 and retain that core of professionals who are involved in that. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, Professor Tarpe and touching on some of the, the, the key issues. I'm really uh, impressed to hear that uh, there is really an effort to move towards database decision making and trying to inform policy or uh, politics within your country. And I think this is uh, some of the elements that um, I'm, I'm uh, very happy to hear both from Antigua as well as Liberia. And you also raise a very key issue of tr building and retaining the talent and the capacity within your own country. And that's something that I, I think uh, we have been struggling a little bit to really come up with a good system to do it. So I'd love to hear more about that. So now let's move on to Jigme, he, who's a manager of the C Secretariat. Um, so because we're on day six now, yeah? Can you share the state of play of the transparency negotiations as you start right now? And where do you see the area's convergence or disagreement? And also from the, the sec perspective of the Secretariat, where do you think countries need support or I would say encouragement most in terms of enhancing transparency at this point? Thank you, over to you. Do you have a microphone? Oh, thank you. You can use two. Uh, thank you, Chis, for very interesting questions. Uh, I'm not sure I will have answer to all the questions, but I'll try. So uh, good morning, uh, colleagues. Um, well, when we talk of transparency in the UN, UNFCC process, the primary 
driver was this desire to have in place arrangement that can you know uh, promote trust and confidence in the process. And it is also one of the core commitments under the convention. And that is good as well as sometimes I feel that that does not help the process. And I'll tell you why. Because so far, we tend to approach this reporting primarily from the lens of we are doing it because it is a commitment. It is commitment to the convention. And that's end of the story. Whereas, as you can see from the panel members here, the intervention from here, there are lo a lot more that uh, transparency can offer nationally. I think it is a very powerful tool for a decision-making process, informed, evidence-based decision-making process. And Costa Rica, I think it's a very uh, solid example of how that can happen. And there are many others. So what I'm trying to say is that, yes, it is a commitment, but that should be secondary, this thing. The primary objective should be how to make best use of what transparency can offer at the national level. Um, and when you do that, the, the commitment to submit this will come as a byproduct. And, and, um, but there are challenges, and I'll, and I'll come to that later. So enhanced transparency framework has to work because the because Paris Agreement was designed as a big tent to accommodate all parties. And, and when you talk of all parties, there is diversity. Diversity in the national circumstances as well as capacity. And that, that has to be fully re recognized. And I do believe that Paris Agreement recognizes that. So, and, and that same spirit applies to uh, transparency. Uh, and in transparency, we have this principle of flexibility to those developing countries who need it in the light of capacity. And, and that, I think, is um, a principle that is put in place to promote universal participation in the um, enhanced transparency framework. And also to give time and space for countries with um, limited capacity to incrementally um, grow their capacity over a period of time so that um, at some point in time down the line uh, with support from international community they can, they can then gradually uh, be in a position to um, do a robust reporting which could also uh, feed into national planning uh, development processes. So the modalities, procedures, and guidelines, which uh, in, in simpler language, I think it's a simply operational rules. Uh, it was adopted in uh, Katowice um, in Poland in 2018. At that point in time, we could not completely finish all the um, necessary work. So we had to leave uh, some of the very technical, uh, detailed technical work. Uh, mainly around how information should be packaged, in the form, whether it should be in a narrative or tabular format. And if it is in a tabular format, how should that look like? What should be the level and depth of this? Uh, so there is ongoing discussion around this um, in terms of um, formats and tables for reporting information on inventory, information on tracking progress of implementation of NDCs, and then information also on support, support in terms of uh, financial resources, capacity building, technology development, and transfer. And that applies both to support provided and mobilized on one hand, as well as support needed and received by developing countries on the other hand. Um, and then in addition to this, there are also ongoing discussion on um, some of the how this reports what this report should co contain. So we are looking at outlines of BTR, um, outlines of technical expert review reports, 
and outlines of national inventory document. So the, as we speak, the discussions are happening and um, the process has produced our draft text. Um, it is, um, we do not expect the work to, to be completed this week because uh, there are still a um, lot of open issues that require further consideration. But I see a great deal of uh, goodwill and determination amongst parties, uh, and, and that is very important. Uh, however, uh, it will not be easy to conclude the work because the scale of work involved is quite huge. Uh, we are, you know, the technical work, it's, it's very voluminous, so it will take, uh, it will require a lot of uh, patience, dedication, hard work from our negotiators but they are capable, capable of doing that. We have done that in the past, and I'm sure we'll be able to do it uh, this time around. Uh, secondly, there are also a few um, issues which will require both um, political solution in addition to technical solution. And for example, um, flexibility is one example. We have the principles, general framework of how, how which provisions would get flexibility in the rule book that we had adopted in Katowice. However, now we will need to translate this general framework into clear operational actionable guidance so that, uh, so that you know, there is no ambiguity in how, how um, this could be. And this is one area where parties still have different vision uh, but I'm, I'm hopeful that they will be able to narrow down this um, different uh, vision that they have and, and come up with a common vision in the next few days. So that's, that's that on, uh, I would say, um, broad landscape of negotiation. But we have to look at uh, this discussion on rule book in conjunction with discussions on support, support for ETF because I think these two goes hand in hand, and parties very well recognize that, especially um, there is widespread recognition that developing countries will not be able to um, transition smoothly from existing to enhanced transparency framework without um, support in place. So, and, and there is ongoing discussion on that as well. So. Uh, the expectation is that it will come out as a package. Um, I'm not sure if I'm going to much. ask you to <laughs> say more about that in the second round. Uh, you know, so so. Okay, Gustavo, can we ask you a question? Sure, go home. Okay, so um, we're going to move into the second round. So we're going to start with you. And this interest of time, let's 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 sort of try to wrap up by ten o'clock because. Everybody has places to go at 10 o'clock. Okay, so CBIT turns five this year, and now, as you know, we're undergoing the replenishment process, right, for the GF Trust Fund. Can you share a little bit of a forward-looking perspectives on the role of the GEF on this p important theme of transparency as well as enabling activities? And um, where do you see us, the GEF, making a real impact in terms of transparency, raising climate ambition, as well as the whole notion of the bedrock of the Paris Agreement. So, Thank you, Chiz, and uh, thanks to all the panelists. And from the perspective of the GEF, uh, we have uh, embraced the transparency framework of the Paris Agreement ever since it was adopted. And we rushed to create uh, some, some measure of support to CBIT. Uh, right after it was asked that the Jeff undertake this activity. And then uh, as the replenishment processes uh, pro progressed in, in Jeff 7 and now into Jeff 8, we mainstreamed support to transparency through CBIT and now uh, through to support to the BTRs uh, into, the, into the body, into the overall work program of the GEF. So it's there to stay, so that's a, that's a good uh, message. I think there is a, a huge amount of interest uh, as we negotiate the Jeff 8 replenishment uh, from the part of the donors that uh, this activity and these activities uh, receive appropriate support. So we've been meeting with them, we've been 
We have had two uh, uh, replenishment meetings. We're going to a third in um, uh, early February. And, uh, and there's a great interest in, in enhancing this, uh, this framework because after all, uh, transparency is the backbone of the Paris Agreement. And by the way, it's becoming also uh, uh, a point of discussion in other conventions. The CBD is now deliberating on a transparency framework for itself. And the JEP provides uh, financing to, uh, to uh, five different conventions. But let me, let me talk about just climate change and biodiversity. We finance uh, NBSAPs, which is a kind of an equivalent of a national reporting and, and target setting for, for the Biodiversity Convention. And to the professor's uh, earlier point, sometimes we receive national reports from the Climate Change, uh, for the climate change Convention and NBSAPs that have totally different information and they don't speak with, with one another. And if we can start to make these processes more robust, uh, it's going to be much easier, I think, to mobilize financing and much easier to also uh, uh, report back on, uh, on actions that uh, are moving these conventions forward. So we believe that uh, by embracing this, uh, this framework, there's probably nothing that we have done uh, so far that would be most uh, uh, powerful. So we are in this game for, for the long haul. And, uh, and thanks uh, to Ambassador Diane uh, Black Lane for uh, making some praise to the way that the Jeff operates, but let me tell you, Diane, that uh, we're not happy either with what we're doing. Uh, so we need to really streamline our processes. We are trying to push uh, a, a discussion with our donors to make sure that while we uh, streamline these, uh, these uh, processes and facilitate access, they are also uh, uh, happy that uh, you know, all the, the checks and balances are built in to the, to the provision of financing. So this is a two-way street, but uh, from the Secretary's perspective, we want to continue uh, pushing forward uh, uh, easier access to, to resources from the GEF. So we are, again, I repeat the third time, we are in for the long haul. Thanks, Jess. Thank you, Gustavo. And I think in your very short message, there were a lot of things that Jigme was taking notes as to, uh, to help inform where we go from here. So back to Diane as well as Professor Tarpey. Two very quick questions. One, how, what would you suggest to other countries uh, to be ETF ready in terms of um, the BTR support as well as CBIT, especially those countries that have yet to engage or think about getting support? And uh, question number two, where do you think countries need the support to transition to ETF successfully? So over to you, Diane, then to Professor. So ETF is markets, you refer to? Yeah, okay. So uh, many countries don't believe that they'll participate in markets. So that's article. The transparency framework. The transparency framework, okay, great. Um, what would I say? Um, I think, like I said before, many countries struggle to make the case to their bosses that this is something to do. And to be frank with you, many developing countries don't have a culture of data collection. So for those countries, a million dollars is not enough. Um, so fortunately for Antigua and Barbuda, we have a new university open up in Antigua. So we've been working with the university to institutionalize this whole thing. So we prefer to work with the university to get data that is validated. So that's the problem that the transparency framework is going to face. The data with all of those tables that we agree in is not done, is government providing that information. So how do we know it's accurate? So we're trying to get our universities involved. So because they have a, a more transparent, robust system of data collection, which is tough for countries. So I don't have an answer right now, but that is going to be a struggle where countries will do the best they can to collect the data, and then the data is going to be questioned. And then I, I hate to bring up controversial issues, but you know what happened with the ease of doing business stuff at the World Bank? Yeah, that didn't help at all. So I think the, the, G, the Jeff is going to have to look at, and even for transparency, how, what is the data validation system that you want to make sure that countries develop and ensure that it's robust. <clears throat> and if that is the case, the, the funds that is being provided now will not be adequate to, to do that. And the Jeff could consider doing a sector-by-sector -sector approach, because when you do across 
economy wide, that money just go like easily. So um, maybe those are some of the strategies that you could use. And one thing about the Jeff, I think we could streamline. And I know UNEP is going to hate me for this and, and UNDP, but <laughs> I know we can do direct access for enabling activities under the Jeff, but it's not that. I don't think many people countries started. I think that's what the GCF have better than the Jeff to do. So maybe you can think about that as well. But I think the 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 CBIT project should be designed from the perspective of the user, the private sector, in our reporting, and to ensure that it, it has integrity and it's as robust as you can within the budget that you have, because you can't control that, and then to see different ways that countries can focus their work. To, uh, but you know, it's better to have focused data and robust data than to have a little bit about everything. Thank you, Diane. I think you touched upon a lot of issues that really we were, we were at the, at the, the center of the, the conversation in the replenishment as well as here. So thank you so much for highlighting those. Professor Tarpe, please. So how, what suggestions and recommendations do you have for other countries that have yet to do the CBIT or get ready for the, trans, uh, the BNM transparency reporting. So that's question number one. And uh, question number two, where do you think countries need more support to transition to the new framework? Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, you know, the first thing you want to do is the operating environment in which you work. You have the private sector and you have the public sector. I keep stressing this point because as long as the policy makers in the operating environment do not understand what you are trying to do or they see what you are trying to do in an adverse situation, you have a problem. So the first thing you have to do is to understand that what you are trying to do is consistent with the National Development Plan. Once you can link the two, like my colleague uh, uh, from uh, um, uh, 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 Costa Rica said, once you, you try to link it and they understand that there is a positive linkage, it's easier. What we did in Liberia was to tell the policymakers that this whole issue of climate change, capacity building, is intended to help you. It drives the national agenda. Once we got over that hub, it became less difficult to drive it. So, we go into the system now, we have an institutionalized framework. We talk to the people in transport, we talk to the people in finance, we talk to the people in uh, energy, we talk to the people in, in, in forestry, they all work along. Again, are we dead yet? No. But we have tried. My advice to my other colleagues in other countries is, the word is awareness, both on the part of the, the, the general population and the policy maker. But the key is to link your activity or what you are trying to do to the national development agenda. Once the CA and there is a buy-in, two things will happen. They will reduce the level of resistance to what you are trying to do, or better still, they will help you to do it. And we've been, we've been able to link that. That would be my advice to them. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's very powerful. So we really need to be hammering on this point. You're not just doing CBIT and BTR because you have to. This is your, it's going to help your country uh, and uh, actually tie it into the development policies or other interministerial coordination. Jigme, I know you need to go very, very, very quickly. What suggestion do you have for the Jeff for the continued rollout of BTR support and for the ongoing CBIT support? Okay, and the system before he comes in, my response to that is to continue to increase the support so we can harness what we already have. There is a framework, there's an architecture, we need to strengthen it, to broaden it in order to retain the quality of people that we have so our output will be much better. Thank you so much. Over to you, Jigme. Thanks, uh, Chis. So, we have been doing this, um, conducting this, um, needs assessment for last two, three years now uh, from uh, developing countries. And um, what we see is few issues that, um, or common theme that you see across the uh, board. And, and that 
relates to, uh, for example, weaker institutional arrangements. Um, the second one is data issues, issues relating to access, availability, uh, as well as compatibility. Sometimes there is data, but you cannot use it directly, and you don't have capacity to process it in a, so that, uh, so, so there are a whole um, gamma of issues, we see gamma of issues around data. And then the technical capacity, the ability to choose and apply methodologies, approaches to do assessment. Um, and then something that seems sometimes, you know, which we do not see quite visibly is this dimension of political buy-in, domestic political buy-in. And in my view, that sometimes play a very um, detrimental role uh, to the point that a country may not have capacity, technical capacity or financial resources, but if there is strong political mandate, they find ways to do it. So that I think it's also important. And finally, I think it's the final, final point is uh, stakeholder engagement. And that includes national legislator and politicians, because I think they also have a role to play. So I see opportunity for CIBIT to play a role in all of this. And, and I think that is going to be a key in the future. Thank you so much. We had allocated a little bit of time on questions and answers. Maybe we can just take one from the audience, or if we have, I don't know if, uh, is, is Kenya still present here? No? Okay. Any, one question uh, from the audience before our panel goes? Yes, miss. Uh, want a microphone? Shout? <laughs> no, here's a microphone. Okay. Because we're web oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you. Can you identify yourself? Say a few words. So, one of the reasons why <coughs> Antigua and Barbuda have been so prominent in preparing our okay, so everything in Antigua is centralized. So, my department we do the NBSAP, so we have coordination, we do the national communication, we do the CBIT, we do the readiness for the GCF, and so on. So, basically, across all of these enabling activities that we access funding. We have a whole team that we can employ to move on. Now, the, the thing is, the JAF and, some, and the GCF in particular doesn't like that. So, I mean, they still don't understand how hard it is in developing countries to retain um, people that you tra train. So, when you're designing the project, they want to know a consultant for four months and stuff like that. So, we, we try to explain as much, and then when they still don't understand, we literally put our feet down and start to scream, we're gonna have to fight about this because this is what we have to be up against. They're accustomed to one way of doing it at the World Bank or somewhere else. So this is what we did. Uh, <clears throat> to augment that, what we have, we have in Antigua a, um, an internship, an apprenticeship program where we bring um, young people from schools, from college, from not only from Antigua and Barbuda, but from the OECS, the Caribbean, and even further abroad. And they come in for the summer and then they can stay on. If you just graduate for six months and we train you and you just, their, their job is to just collect baseline data. And what we're noticing is that many ch young people graduating from school and have no clue how to collect baseline data. So we have had to be, so we now understand why the professionals in the civil service or in the private sector, they too are not accustomed to collecting baseline data. So you wonder what kind of decisions government and private sector has been making all along. So we put those, so you have to negotiate hard with the Jeff and the GCF and stand firm in what you want to do and gently and politely and, be, and stay friends. And, um, and then we found the apprenticeship program to be really helpful. It's a pain in the tush, but um, 
we do it anyway, and we've had great results um, to do that. So that's what I would suggest, especially if you're small like us. Yeah, I think my sister is right. Uh, it, it's a challenge, especially when you have a matrix there. A matrix meeting, here you have the environmental agency or ministry, and you have to rely on information coming from a sector ministry, which employs civil servants. Okay, so how do we create the linkage? It, it's a challenge. So when we talk about retention, what my sister said is exactly what we do at the EPA, but we elevated that a little bit. We have an internship. We have people graduating. In fact, through the, the support that we receive, we have a graduate school. I think we, have, we, we are here with the president of the University of Liberia. We have a graduate school for environmental science. So that is where we get our people from. So we, we bring them in as interns, but each is assigned to a trained scientist and expert to bring them up. But like my sister said, there has to be some compensation for that. We have to be able to provide some compensation. If you left it with the civil service, they would say, okay, you know what? That's the government budget. <laughs> you know, we're not prepared to do much of that. As much as we are willing to listen to you, uh, we're not sure if we can do that. But you find that to be very important. And that's the, uh, somebody said, that's the capacity building with the cap. <laughs> so you do keep the building without the cap. I mean, you develop the, the infrastructure, you develop the people to work, but you do not provide any incentive for them to produce what you have to produce. So it's a challenge, but it can be done. In the case of Liberia, we have an internship program. But again, it is... Yeah, right, that's it. You have the CBA for the project, but you need it to, be able to, to, to stay in. So what Jeff need to look at probably, not probably, look at it in another way, expand that, and if you have these restrictions on paying people, or that, don't see it in the sense that, oh, we're paying salaries. Not necessarily that. You're trying to retain that capacity. Thank you. OK, thank you so much for that. Um, we're gonna wrap up this conversation. Um, thank you so much for sharing really, really in, um, deep insights as well as practical suggestions to the GEF. I personally very much enjoy the conversation because it's not just about talking generally about transparency and reporting. This is really, um, as we speak, the conversations in the negotiations rooms going on. And it, it, I very much appreciate your candor as well as giving us great insights as well as suggestions. So with that, I'm, we're going to close this panel. I'd like to thank the, uh, the all-star panel here from uh, Antigua, Liberia, Triple C Secretariat, and also former Minister of uh, Environment and Energy of Costa Rica, who happens to be my boss. Thank you so much. Thank you.